the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. Glory be to the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, now and ever in the ages of all ages. Amen. The Lord Jesus expressed great joy in today's gospel. The Lord Jesus expressed great joy because he saw what happens to a person who deliberately chooses him. <clears throat> He saw what happens to a person being God, knowing all things and knowing every heart and every soul. He saw what happens to the soul that chooses and he wishes for this to happen, for every soul to choose. That's why at the beginning of the gospel said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven. It says he rejoiced in the spirit. The Lord rejoiced in the spirit and said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and prudent and revealed them to babes. Even so, Father, so it seemed good in your sight. The wise and the prudent were exemplified in the lawyer he spoke to at the end, right? Because at the end, he tells him, the lawyer asks the Lord and says to him, testing him, again, because it was a, a legalistic way of being religious. So following rules and regulations and laws. And that's why the Lord responded to his question when he said to him, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? The question was asked in a testing mode and was asked simply to, not for a particular reason for my own personal edification, but for a, just to ask a question, for a test. So it says that the Lord asked him back, what is written in the law? You'll notice you may ask God many questions. And quite often God's going to ask you a question. So in your prayers or in your dialogues with the Lord, you may ask him a question in your prayers and he will quite often reply to your question with a question. The reason for that is not to play games. The reason for that is because the question is supposed to lead to a life-giving answer. So he answered and said, having studied the law, being a lawyer, being legalistic, being religious, not spiritual in that sense, he knew exactly what, it was, what was written. So he told him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind. And what's the continuation? And your neighbor as yourself. Those two are linked. The Lord says in another passage, on these two hang everything. Everything written from Genesis to the end of time hangs on this. Loving God and loving your neighbor. So the Lord said, and he said to him, you have answered rightly. Do this and you will live. He didn't say read this and you will live. He didn't say memorize this and you will live. He didn't say study this and you will live. He simply says do. Go and do this and you will live. Why is this so important? Let's look at some different passages. All throughout scripture we see different events in the life of our Lord. And we see different examples in the Gospels and in the letters of the Apostles, in prophecies in the Old Testament about this going and doing, doing something about it. So for example, you know the passage in Luke 4, we read this in the 11th hour of the Igbeya. It was also read last night in Vespers. It says that the Lord, when the sun was setting, after he departed the synagogue and went to Simon's house, it says that when... The sun was setting, all those who had anyone sick with various diseases brought them to him. And he laid his hands on every one of them and healed them. What does that mean? That the Lord has power to heal? We know he has power to heal. That he, uh, he is good? We know he's good. That he's capable? We know he's capable. All that is true. But what this is trying to exemplify to us is that he did not leave anyone behind. When the Lord took flesh... It was for every soul. So in this example here, he laid hands on every one of them. So it says that tons were coming. They were coming to him in droves. He laid hands on every one of them. He didn't leave anyone behind. Now this morning in the Matins Gospels from, from the Gospel of St. Mark, it says, now in the morning, so imagine the Lord was basically on a circuit from one place to the other, healing and preaching and being there for everyone and so on. Then in the morning, having risen a long while before daylight. 
So again, the Lord giving us a pattern, and St. Paul spoke to us about this pattern in today's letter. He gave us a pattern to follow. He says, imitate this if you want to live. Imitate this if you want to grow. He says that he had risen a long while before daylight. You know how hard it is. I'm sure some of you are trying to do this. Some of you are making an effort to wake up extra early in the morning to pray. Extra early in the morning to read. Extra early in the morning to spend time with the Lord. And you know very well how hard that is. Especially if you've slept late. Or you had a really rough day before. Or evening. Or night. Or didn't sleep too well. So you know how hard it is to wake up before dawn. Because you just want to sleep in. And the colder the weather gets. And the later the sun rises. The harder it is for you to get up that early. But... The Lord gave us this as a pattern. He says, I know it's difficult, but it bears fruit. I know it's hard, but it bears fruit. So he went out and departed to a solitary place, and there he prayed. It's because the point is, here is the commandment. Go and do. So how can I go and do? Where can I get the strength to go and do? He says, spend time with the Lord. Go and spend time daily with the Lord. I, I really promise you, that a few minutes spent with the Lord, sacrificing maybe 10, 15, 20, 30 minutes of sleep, those few minutes that have been spent with the Lord will compensate those minutes lost of sleep. Will compensate them in ways that, are, that cannot be explained. Because from a logical standpoint, it doesn't make sense. If you didn't get enough sleep, you will be tired, period. That's true. But over time, the grace of God enables you to cope and to overcome. Not because we are able in and of ourselves, but because He is good and He is able. So it says that Simon and those who were with him were searching for him. They didn't know where they went because they woke up in the morning, they couldn't find him. Where did he go? So they started searching for him to find him. So when they found him, they said to him, everyone is looking for you because you just healed tons of people. Yesterday and the day before, and you'll continue to do so. So everyone has been searching for you. They woke up asking for you. Where are you, Lord? Where is Jesus? Where is Jesus of Nazareth? We need him. We need to speak to him. So everyone was looking for him. But here was the Lord's answer to that. Let us go into the next towns. So basically, I have to move on to the next town. So we served here today. We've got to serve there tomorrow. And the other day tomorrow. And here tomorrow. And there tomorrow. Why did he say this? That I may preach there also. Again, because the message is for all. For your neighbor is all. It is for everyone. That's why he laid hands on every one of them. That's why he went to the next town also. And that's why he said that I may preach there also. Because for this purpose I have come forth. See, this is the law of liberty. St. James spoke to us today about the law of liberty. We're going to talk about that in a second. The, the law of liberty is the foundation of this law is to have a purpose. It's to have a vision. It's to have a goal. It's a purpose. In the book of Acts it says, with purpose of heart. Meaning like, I know exactly why I'm doing this. I'm not just beating the air, as St. Paul was saying. Saying, I have a purpose in doing the things that I'm doing. So then it says, and he was preaching in their synagogues. He was preaching in their synagogues throughout all Galilee and casting out demons. So you see, he went everywhere. He made sure, again, to leave no stone unturned. Again, this is the point of going and doing likewise. That when, because we know very well that this, in this gospel that we read today, the continuation of it, they're going to ask him, well, who is my neighbor? And when the Lord wanted to exemplify who the neighbor is, he gave the parable of the Samaritan. <laughs> That good Samaritan who should have been the least likely to care for anyone. Especially a Jew like him. But he went and stopped and helped that Jew. So the point is, your neighbor is everyone. And the Lord will send you your neighbor at different times, at different days, in different ways. Because there is no limit to who he will be present within. And that's why he said, when you do it to the least of my brothers or sisters, you're doing it directly to me. 
So what does St. Paul say about that? We heard them today, and he said, for this, if you go to, the, if you guys put the, the Pauline epistle, 2 Timothy, it says, for this reason I also suffer these things. So St. Paul, knowing these things, knowing what the Lord went through, knowing why he came, says, for this reason, I also suffer. What do you mean you suffer, St. Paul? Well, I'm about to be beheaded shortly. He wrote this letter, and this was the last one before his death. He said, for this reason, I also suffer these things. Sleeplessness often, fasting, prayer, all kinds of different things, being stoned to death, being shipwrecked, all the way till martyrdom. He said, for this reason, I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I'm not ashamed. I, I am suffering. It's not easy. It's not easy. But I'm not ashamed. Well, how are you not ashamed? Because... There's a grace that's enabling me. He says, for I know whom I have believed and I am persuaded. I am convinced. When St. Paul uses the word persuaded more than once in his letters. When he wants to say persuaded, he's trying to emphasize a point for us to also become persuaded. For us also to become convinced, to stop thinking with this and start thinking with this. With the heart. Combining the two. You have, you have the mind to think, but you also have a heart. And that heart combined with the mind can do great things. So he goes on to say, hold fast the pattern of sound words. Again, there's a pattern. What pattern of sound words? So whatever that was preached in the Gospels, whatever was passed on by the apostles, then St. Paul receives it, and now he's passing it on to the young bishop, Timothy, so he can pass it on to others. So it says, hold fast the pattern of sound words which you have heard from me in faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. That good thing which was committed to you keep by the Holy Spirit who dwells in us. How do I keep it? Again, how can I keep this commandment? I keep it by the Holy Spirit who dwells in me. So in other words, it's basically saying, Holy Spirit, you who dwells in me, you who purifies all things and dwells on things enable me lord to fulfill this because i can't fulfill it alone this is agreed upon i cannot fulfill it alone now again about this holy spirit point the holy spirit who dwells in us what is what is the emphasis here i mean if i ask you what's what's the reason why you're here this morning if i ask you why are you here today why are you in church early in the morning you could have been sleeping you could have been out for brunch been out on the lake you could have been you could have been you could have been many things you could have been doing but at least you all have chosen to be here why so well we want to be here because we need to be okay i'm here because what else what else am i here for pardon uh, refuel absolutely to refuel what else to pray what else repentance very good. What else? Ultimately, what's our goal as Christians? If I ask you, what's your goal as a Christian? To go to heaven, right? To go to heaven, correct? That's a good answer. But it's not complete. It's not complete. I mean, yes, we all want to get to heaven. That's beautiful. But why do you want to be in heaven? To be with God. To be united with the Lord. That's heaven. If I'm not united with him, what's the point? If, I'm, if there's no unity with Christ, then how is there heaven? If he is not where I'm going, how is it heaven? So ultimately, this is why the, whole, the acquisition of the Holy Spirit or requesting the work of the Holy Spirit in my life is ultimately for this. It's not like, you know, imagine someone, imagine a bride who lives... A young girl who lives at home, she can't stand her fa parents, her family, and she can't wait to leave the house. Suddenly, this really nice guy comes and gets to know her. They fall in love. He wants to marry her. Sounds wonderful. Sounds romantic. Sounds like a movie. Great. And then what? Well, she basically, without her parents' consent, with their consent, it doesn't matter. She just wants to leave the house. But then she tells him, listen, I'm only marrying you to get out of this. I'm not marrying you because I love you. 
I'm marrying you because I need to get out of this misery I'm living in. A lot of people look at heaven and earth this way. Or heaven, earth, and hell this way. It's like, I just don't want to go to hell. And I'm tired of living on earth. So I just want to get to heaven. Okay, but how would this groom or this man feel if his, his bride-to-be, the one he proposed to, tells him, listen, I don't really care about you that much. You're a nice guy and everything. But you're just my way out of this mess. Jesus is not just a way out of a mess. Jesus is the way, period. The way to holiness, the way to joy, the way to peace, the way to righteousness, the way to no more tears shed. And it's a, a gradual purpose and a gradual way up to the kingdom. So we're called to remember this. And St. Paul went on to say later in the next chapter in this passage is you therefore my son be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus be strong again how he's telling to be strong he's not just telling be strong period he says be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus then he later says in verse 3 you therefore must endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ you must endure it's going to be tough Again, he reminds him, it's not going to be easy, but it will definitely be worth it. Verse 4 is very important. You see it on the screen right now. It's very important. See, verse 3 is an introduction to what verse 4 is all about. In verse 3, St. Paul says to St. Timothy, he says to you and I today, you therefore must endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. A soldier going to battle comes back with all kinds of pains. But he's rewarded for, or she's rewarded for that pain. So verse 4, he says, No one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who enlisted him as a soldier. So St. Paul putting this here is trying to illustrate this being a good soldier. What is being a good soldier? A good soldier doesn't allow his or herself to be distracted with the affairs of this life. So, well, I have no choice. I have responsibilities. I know. I have to go to work. I know. I have early work tomorrow morning. I know. I have an assignment due tomorrow at 8 a.m. I know. I have traffic to worry about in the morning. I know. I have to drop the kids off to school. I know. School costs a lot of money. I know. Tell me everything and we all agree. Yes. We know that's how it is. But there's a difference between taking my responsibilities seriously and fulfilling my duties, and being entangled, entrenched, obsessed with the affairs of this life. There's a difference. There are, we all have responsibilities. But am I drowning in them or are, am I taking care of them? See the difference? Am I drowning in my responsibilities, sinking? Or am I dealing with them as I need to, being faithful to these responsibilities? So when St. Paul said that, at the end in verse 7, he gives other examples. We'll look at them at another time. In verse 7, in the next slide, he said, Consider what I say. St. Paul is telling us, Consider what I'm telling you, and may the Lord give you understanding. He says, may, may God help you understand what it is I'm trying to say, he's saying. Can we jump to the Catholic epistle, please? St. James, verse 8. St. James in the verse 8 said something again to illustrate what did the Lord mean. When he said, go and do likewise. This is the commandment, you're right. Can you do it? Go and do it. So St. James says, if you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you do well. You live. You do well and you live if you do this. But if you show partiality, you commit sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. What is this partiality? Meaning that, I'll treat this neighbor really well, and I'll treat this neighbor not so well. So maybe I like my neighbor that lives next to me or in front of me because they whatever. But the one behind me, eh, no way. For example, or at work, there is this person that sits next to me on this side. They're very pleasant. We have coffee before we work. We talk. We laugh. We joke. We gossip about the other people at work. But the one on this side stinks. They're horrible. There are this and that. This is partiality. It says, this one is your neighbor, and this one is your neighbor. Both are your neighbor. 
So he says, we end up being convicted by this law. Because you either fulfill the law or break it. And since I can't fulfill it in and of myself, I have the grace of God to enable me to fulfill it. So he says, whoever shall keep the whole law and yet stumble in one point is guilty of all. So if we jump to verse 12, what does it say? The last verse on that screen. So speak and so do. You see how the Lord, again, St. James, the, the, the apostles, the Holy Spirit is giving the same flow of what the Lord said in the gospel. Go and do. So speak and so do as those will be judged by the law of liberty. What is the law of liberty? What is the law of liberty? The law of liberty means that I love God and I can do anything. I am no longer bound to anything. It's kind of like when St. Paul says, all things are lawful, but not all things edify. All things are lawful, but I will not be brought under the power of any. In other words, I am free because I love. This is basically the point of what St. James is saying here for us today. So please think about this with me today. And consider the words that were just told us. And consider the meaning of purpose of heart. The law of liberty means if you lived according to the world, because the law of liberty being what? Having done this, you fulfill. Love is what? The fulfillment of the law. If you've loved, if you love the Lord and your neighbor with no partiality to who that neighbor is, then you have fulfilled the royal law. And having fulfilled the royal law, you enter into the kingdom of that royalty. You enter into the joy of your Lord. This is basically what we're called to do. I leave you with a very nice small quote from St. Isaac the Syrian who once said, Prayer, to which beautiful actions are not attached, is an eagle whose wings have been plucked. So to pray is great. Go to church, it's wonderful. To be a Christian, excellent. All this is great, but it's only proven true when it's done, not when it's said. So the first one that can be convicted as a transgressor in what just was just said here up here today is myself in front of you. Because here I am saying it, now the Lord will tell me personally, well, you've said it to the congregation. Will you do it? Are you doing it? This is the message for all of us. This is the law of liberty. Going and doing. And that's how we live. Glory be to God forever and ever. Amen.